So one of the things for, uh, for the Cirrus user is, I like this map. If you really look at this, this map, I don't know how many of you used this, that map in your refractive uh, screening. It's called the curvature, you get the curvature symmetry, the front and the back. You get the, the BCV, uh, which is front, back, and, uh, and it, you get a composite uh, 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 graph. It's, it's more like, like when, I mean, it, I don't know what, why they have made it, but it looks like they want you to give you a, some feel like maybe a bad D, like a picture where you are able to pick up one thing very fast. So it, it may be a good screening tool for your optometrist or yourself to just look into that. But there are very nice features when you're doing a cross-linking. Because many times when you're doing a cross-linking, your key idea is how it is changing and how much it's changing. So if you go to the compare maps on, uh, you, can, you can go to some other patient and you'll see that is something which all of you should use. If you are a refractive surgeon, uh, if you are using your uh, post cross linking, and if you, if I just pick up one of the comparison map, uh, it doesn't matter what this is. Maybe a topo guided laser or whatever this is. And if you see that all your images are out there, and uh, it's all, it all comes here. So instead of going just the map like how you do a pre op, it is something which you can. Uh, And just go to the compare indices, please. And you can see uh, the pre and the post. That we all know. But there is one where you have an indices there. And keratoconus uh, follow-up. This is very interesting. Because use this in your follow-up patients. Because it compares whatever indices I just mentioned. It actually it gives you this. This is very important because it tells you from two visits. It tells you the, the friend BCV. You can change. For example, you can change uh, uh, the friend to the back. And you can also, I think there are some more, uh, uh, I mean, this is also it can, uh, it can check. This is one very useful tool if you are looking at uh, post cross linking follow ups. Uh, it even gives changes the corneal thickness. For example, RMS area we mentioned. This is one of the front surface, the back surface. I mean, the most confusing part of Cirrus is the 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 terminologies being used. Do we agree, Professor Saylor? There's no. It's not a single word. It's a huge, big, big words, and it's all pure optical words, which makes it uh, quite confusing. And uh, you can even have a difference map of the comparison out there. Anything else on this? Uh, and if you go to one of the uh, uh, post-operative with this high spherical aberration, we'll show them the LSA being high. So, I don't think it needs to be worried about not having one value or one number which is abnormal, which you're not able to pick up. Uh, Cirrus needs a little bit more thinking. You have to sit down and read than just having one number that, okay, this is the number, this is the golden number, and we, if that number is abnormal, that is not going to happen in Cirrus. You have to look at everything. Yes, sir? <coughs> Again, I don't use this serious, so... I'm even more ignorant than sometimes when I speak, but um, as a baseline, that would be an advantage, the fact that there's not one number that people look at, because there is no one number that's good at screening, not any. So if you get stuck on that one number, and especially if you want to look at what color the box is, uh, you're going to be wrong frequently. So. Uh, so don't hope that they come up with that number because unless someone does a study with 100,000 patients watched over five years time uh, with very aggressive surgeons, you're simply not going to develop a number for refractive surgery screening 
that is truly validated. Yeah, but, but Brad, I mean, we are, we are used to have not a number. It's always the technicians and the physicists coming in and telling us, we would like to have that number, one parameter that says yes, keratoconus, no keratoconus. We in the clinical environment, we are used to have not only one number. We are looking at a patient, looking at the anterior chamber, looking for the endothelial, looking for, so in essence, it's not unusual for us not to find one number. It, for us, it's always a multidimensional diagnosis, and so it's not surprising that we are going that way. Um, the only hope that I had was to find that number by prion spectroscopy. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it did not work out that way. But in the future approaches, prion and MFT, we'll give a talk about this later on, most probably you will have that number if you, you measure them in the surface parallel, yeah. prion and shift. But even then, it would be one of several parameters sure. that but helps to make that diagnosis. What, what you said is absolutely correct, but us is because us is old, and us is using all of this. Most people coming in, regardless of what they may say, they want to look at an indice, and that's, it's dangerous because that's not the, the, where the best information lies. The best information lies in flipping through the different displays and looking at all the different maps. So one of the take-home points for the Cirrus users is use this map more frequently than you ever used. This, this map helps you to look at one state. If the patient is a patient, you have done two scans, and he's, you want to know whether it's progressing or not. If you just look at one map and one thickness, you probably would not be really looking at whether you're seeing a change. For example, you have the thickness maps, you have the curvature maps, the, the total the back surface uh, aberrations, the uh, the back surface, the front surface abrasion, the corneal thickness. This is a great map for a keratoconus screening in your practice. This is a great map for looking at progression. This is a great map for looking at stability. This is a great map for looking at if you've done one of your uh, corrections. This is one of the wonderful maps out there. And if this is changing, for example, this patient, let's assume that at baseline it was 47 or it goes to 58 or it's the other way around and you can have the two time visits out here. This tells you the amount of change. This tells you the amount of change. The PACI has changed. This tells you the amount of, uh, this is uh, uh, the root mean square, the front and the back. I mean, this, that means basically what I'm trying to say is, I mean, we have discussed about Pentacam, we're going to discuss about it now, but if you don't have it, there are enough tools out there only thing you need to do is just click the buttons and get it. It's just because it's not seen on your main screen. It just doesn't mean that it does not exist. And uh, if I go back to the, uh, to the same patient, uh, so this, you just show how to go. If somebody can just click a button, how, uh, just see how to reach this map. Because many times this is one of the least used comparison maps. Go down to Keratoconus follow-ups. And go, go back one minute, go back, go back to the same thing. There are two interesting things here which you should do. Uh, keratoconus follow-ups, refractive surgery follow-ups. Go down. Both are very important if a patient comes to you for refractive surgery. So it is important that you ask your optometrist or people when they give a printout, you can ask for this based on what you're looking for. And uh, there's also somewhere, uh, a cataract surgery, Natasha, do you know where it is on this? The cataracts, yeah, cataract summary. In this cataract, if you click the cataract summary out there, you get this. And you, what you do is they have added uh, the keratometry here, they're given the power, but they have not really gone too deep into the how the regular, the shape of your cornea is. They're not, that is something which is kind of missing. For example, the surgery plan does not give you that. That is one major fallacy because it only assumes that it is the curvature which is important and nothing else. For that, if you go back, close that, close this button here, close this, and it gives you the long axis. And for that, I think one of the most important thing, especially if you're doing a multifocal, is the BCV. The, there's a BCV here which tells you that it, it's just but nothing but the aberration irregularity. It's just nothing that how the cornea is aberrated the whole cornea. It is not taking one point, like here. It's 
it just gives you the entire overall picture. And in this, you can see that these black bands are always out of it. And uh, Dr. Pauja is here. I think he's a, one of the most uh, uh, meticulous IOL surgeons in Pune. Which part do you use when you're calculating for your IOL in this? Because he uses only this. You can come here with me and just pick up and show. It'll be wonderful. I don't think yeah, you can do that, please. Okay, I, I asked him to put something up to kind of just make, make a point. So the upper, this is the patient. Why don't you show the bad display for a second? Just switch to the bad, and then we'll switch right back to this one, and hopefully it'll, we won't lose the, what we did. So this is clearly an ab, abnormal eye. We see it's roughly, uh, you know, four, four standard deviation outside the norm. There's a visible posterior ectasia. There's a very early change on the very early change in the anterior surface. We have an abnormal pachymetric pro progression. We have a thin cornea and basically one, two, three, four, like at least nine parameters are outside the normal range. Now go back to the map we had on b before. Good. So I won't argue as far as the anterior surface goes, but you'll hear a lot of people will say curvature is more sensitive than elevation, vice versa. We've looked at it, there's no real difference, but that's moot, that's not. The, the thing is, that's anterior surface. When you deal on the, on the posterior surface, I want you to see now, none of you would have difficulty at the lower right map noticing that that's a posterior ectasia. It's very easy to see, okay? I use the most sensitive scales for the posterior curvature that's on the machine, and you would have difficulty looking at both the axial curvature on the upper left and the tangential curve on the upper right to determine whether that's normal or not. And that's because, again, curvature on the posterior surface is a low power minus lens, and it's a uh, cornea aqueous interface, so these changes get masked because we're not dealing with air cornea. So you can see it looks, it, if all I showed you was a curvature map of the back of the cornea, you would say, hey, it looks pretty normal to me, and there's a prominent posterior ectasia. So people always ask, you know, why we don't also show curvature on certain things, and that's one of, the, one, one of the reasons. On the anterior surface, it'll pick up, there's really not a clinical difference between sensitivity on curvature or ele ele elevation. But on the posterior surface, curvature gets masked by the fact that it's a true posterior low power minus lens, and elevation has nothing to do with index of refraction. And uh, coming back, shifting gears to this side, uh, again, this patient, Dr. Pahuja, this patient has astigmatism. Yeah. Is uh, the, 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 all your values which we are given, let's assume that they are normal, but go back again. Yeah, look, go, go back, look at this, that LSA, the longitudinal spherical collaboration, is trying to show you that there's more irregularity out here. There's more on the noisy side. So as a cataract surgeon at this point of time, let's assume that this patient has a cataract. If you're using Cirrus, what parameters are your favorite? Quickly, if you can just show us and why. Two things. Two things that I just look at this. One is that I have to just look at an ocular surface because when you do a topography, if your ocular surface is not good, you get a lot of irregularities on the surface. So, you know, one that you have to look at this. This, uh, I mean, you repeat it, and if you two or three times when you get in the same reading, so then probably you also have to look at an ocular surface. And second thing, you know, when you get an astigmatism like this, so you, when you plan for your rhetoric IOLs, you have to look at an axis. If this axis matches with your, with your K reading that you get on an manual K, if this matches with you, then probably you are going to be on dot. This one, here, yeah. yeah. This one, right? <coughs> so. So this is one. And uh, the third thing is, when you go into an cataract summary, if you have an axial length, you can just put into that and also get an IOL power. So it has an IOL. Uh, OK. It's OK. It's not working. It's not coming. OK. And second thing is, when you, <coughs> uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, how much this can be used for an, uh, 
for an, uh, for an glaucoma, not glaucoma, but I mean if you see in a patient who is hyperopic, is getting it. So you have to look at an uh, angles also where you, you go into an uh, glaucoma summary and you can see the uh, angle and plan for your cataract surgery, how much you glaucoma summary. Any patient, any reflective patient. As, as they're getting ready, uh, Professor Bellin, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, when we're using a topography, uh, well, let's looking at, say, if somebody can put the progression on the, on the pentacamp, please. So what would be your definition, and I'll ask uh, uh, each one of you, what would be your uh, criteria of progression? If somebody says that this is progressing, is this, uh, I mean, this is not the progression. If you can, somebody can put the progression one. So what, it, is there a value? Professor Saylor, what would be the criteria for progression? One diopter, point five diopters. How do you define a progression you know, on, say, a pentacam or any topographer? No, okay, that can I ask yeah, them to flip over so I can show us something on the screen? The problem is every time I'm plugging in for something today, when I plug in the VGA here, my screen goes blank. So give me a second. I'll plug in and see if you can show it on, on the screen. But you can answer it okay. by the time it's getting now, ready. Now, the problem with that progression is the, the, the toughest one we have today because it's always very, very difficult to decide whether keratoconus is progressive. Uh, as a guideline, if you're not sure that it's progressive, now it's don't do cross-linking, at least in, in, in Switzerland. That's an iron rule. Um, currently, we are looking for, uh, for, if the K-max stays at the same side, it does not move, then we are going for, if it's more than one diopter, and it's not too far advanced, uh, we believe that this is a good sign for progression. If the difference in K-max is one diopter and more. But this is true only for, for, for um, grade one and two of keratoconus. For grade three and four, the limit is much higher because the uncertainty or the me measurement error of K-max is bigger. So um, according to that English publication from Moorfields, I think they had uh, in grade three, it was 1.8 diopters, and in, in, in grade four, they didn't give a recommendation anymore about progression. But in grade four, you wouldn't do a cross-linking anyway. So, so that is not of importance anymore. So if the patient, if let's for, forget about this number here, if this patient uh, we still don't have that uh, now, so that uh, let's assume that we, had, we only have the, this progression. If it was 0.4 here, 4 diopters, 0.4 diopters, and after it is... It uh, keeps then, uh, then isn't it also important to see if, if you see that that keratoconus has become worse by, in K-max by 0.4 diopters or so, isn't that also important to see which time there was in between Six so months. Let six take months. It six months. So, would you look at only 0.4 or 0.5 adapters, or you would also add the value of a thickness being changing, or do you also add anything to the posterior anterior? Uh, we, we know that the thickness number is some, somewhat difficult to to is, to establish because remember that the thickness is um, a kind of average measurement of many meridians and then you have the average that fit over in the pentacam at least in any shine flu camera at least and therefore the thickness also uh, after c after cross-linking that the corner gets thinner after cross-linking is an optical artifact so thickness is for me not the most important part but if it thins also and and the k-max increases and the k-max stays at the same position as it was then that K-max rule supply. In this case, I would say, this is hey, definitely a progress, let's, but wait, let's wait another six months and see whether we have a trend. So basically, uh, for all the uh, topography users, both this or this or any machine suffers from a huge issue of repeatability, especially when you're doing on a, on a topography on a, 
uh, on a keratoconic eye. That means that if I do the same scan on this patient now, I give him two minutes and do the same scan second time and third time, the variation in this zone, we published this in IOV is uh, a paper comparing this, this, Cirrus and Galilei. The variation of it is 0.5 to 0.6 diopters on, a little less on this, around 0.5 on this and op scan that variability of one diopter. And thickness map which says here, the, it differed by eight microns on this, maybe a nine and on Pentacam it was around 18 to 20 microns. That means that if this patient has come to you and you call the patient to come back after six months and you say I'm going to observe you and the patient says you have a, you have a progression of 0 0.06 diopter with six microns of change of the PACI in any of these machines. I'm not, I don't care which one. You have to, first thing is, you have to probably repeat the, repeat, repeat the scans two or three times to see if the repeatability is within range. The younger the age group, the more unpredictable the repeatability is. The children, especially, we, we, we are always worried about the progression in children and the child comes with only 0.4 or 0.5 diopters, we think it's progressing. The challenge there is the repeatability. Without repeatability, I don't think none of the topographers are now perfect enough to say that what I did today on May 19 will hold the same when you reach May 20th, uh, sorry, next year, May 19th. So challenge here is do the repeatability and if it's in the range, so what I do is, uh, I'll, then I'll leave it to Professor Bellin to talk about his indices, which makes it much more easier. If it's in the range of 0.5, and I don't still consider sometimes as progression, the reason being it's still under repeatability range. So you call it, is it in the repeatability range or not? And every topographer has his own repeatability range. So that means if it's a repeatability range, and your PACI is just 8 microns difference and the K-max is around 0 0.2, 0 0.5 microns, that means it may not be a progression of keratoconus, it just may be in the zone of repeatability. Can I add one, one, one comment to that one? I mean, uh, that it's not a fixed number 0.5 or 0.6, it's three times the standard deviation of your measurement. Remember that if you have... Uh, if no, you the reason I just break you here, the reason I use that number is what we published okay. of that number. We used the three times of all the three machines and it's published in IWS about in keratoconus patients about the repeatability. So in that repeatability, the 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.04 was the repeatability of Pentacam, 0.5 or 0.6 was from the Cirrus and the op scan was close to a diopter. So th I'm just quoting the number of what is published. So, um, <coughs> I will dis disagree to some degree, probably a huge degree. Uh, one is I hate K-max. I think it's a useless parameter. Useless parameter for two reasons. One is particularly determining progression on a, a newly diagnosed keratoconic patient. Effectively, you're telling that patient that they have to have changes on the anterior surface. In other words, they have to have some loss of vision. And then to determine progression, your vision has to get even worse. So. And in the U.S., actually, unfortunately, a lot of insurance companies are mandating that we use a change in K-max of at least one diopter. Well, that would be the equivalent of having someone come into your office with high blood pressure and say, yeah, your, high, your pressure's high, but we don't give you medication until after your first stroke. Okay, that's not how we treat patients. So um, this is an example I put up here, and this is the new uh, ABCD pr progression display. The other problem with K-max, it's a single point. So the ABCD looks at more of a global parameter. It's a three millimeter zone centered on the thinnest point. And A is for the anterior radius of curvature at the three millimeter zone centered, basically centered on the cone. B is for back or posterior. C is the thinnest point, not an apical reading. And D is, an, you have to put it in an operator system since it's distance visual acuity. The reason I'm showing you this is, if you look here, I don't know if you can read it. This is yeah, this is safe to stand on. This column here is K, K max. K max has actually gotten better over a year and a half. Not a huge amount, but there's no statistical significance in K max. As I stand closer, I can't read it, but it, 
I think it's 50.2 here and 50.3 here. So it hasn't changed. But now let's look at the progression on the back surface here and corneal thickness here. These gates represent an 80% and 95% confidence interval. The green is based on a normal population, which is what you would use for your very early cones. The red is the noise levels of measurement for the keratoconic pop population. So this patient has highly statistically significant change on the back surface of the cornea at a uh, almost 95%, corneal thickness past 95%, in spite of the fact that there's been no change in K-max. I can, I can show a bunch of other patients very similar to this. K-max is a late finding change. And if our goal is to preserve vision, using K-max, we're not gonna be able to do that. The goal is, again, to identify patients as early as possible, determine if they're progressing and intervene to prevent a loss of vision, not to treat them after they've already lost vision. And uh, I can show up, I can pull up a couple other ones very similar to that, that again, we can show really statistically significant change at a 95% confidence interval in spite of the fact that K-max is stable.